when I die and life doesn't, some of my actions will continue to affect the life of, and consciousness of others. So when I put life and consciousness at the center of what I care about, not my life and my consciousness, because there is no real happiness in narcissism. There is no meaningful human life in that, right? You were asking, what is mental health? Is there any definition of mental health I care about that does not involve deep compassion and empathy? No. Is there any way to have deep compassion and empathy without suffering deeply? No. Is the version of mental health I want one where people have suffered <laughs> and they can then be in deep connection with other people suffering in a way where we don't get rid of it, but we see the potential for nobility and beauty and, and grace and how we relate to it. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. So Daniel Schmachtenberger, welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here. I've wanted to have you here for so long. Um, you are literally my hero, and I think many people's heroes. I'm not alone in this. And um, you're one of the most extraordinary humans I've ever come across, and I don't say that lightly. You are. You combine an absolute brilliant intellect with a depth of knowledge that is unrivaled. As far as I've, I'm concerned, I've never met anyone with your knowledge in terms of its depth and breadth and scope. You are also one of the kindest people I know and wisest. And so I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here. And what I'd love to talk about, obviously I'll introduce you, but I'd love to talk about sort of the future of mental health. But in terms of introducing you, you're just such an extraordinary person. It's hard to figure out, hard to sum that up. But I would say just briefly, you're the founder of the Civilization Research Institute um, that focuses on studying catastrophic and existential risk. And you advise, you know, governments and institutions on catastrophic risk. And you... Uh, as part of that, have something called the Consilience Project, which is a um, which hopefully you can tell us more about actually. And in terms of functional medicine, you know, not only do you know about exponential tech and AI and climate change and all the grave risks that humanity uh, faces, but also you are an expert in many ways in the healthcare system and in human health. And you have in your past had your own struggles with sort of complex chronic illness, which you managed through your own efforts to address and, and heal. And so through this, you've, you know, learned a huge amount about functional medicine and integrative health, and you've helped set up functional medicine clinics. You've helped uh, set up Neurohacker Collective, and you've developed supplements. You've been head of head of R and D there, so you've done a, a very wide ranging number of things. But what I'd love to discuss with you today is is really our mental health crisis, you know, which is affecting so many of us on so many levels. And what I'm particularly concerned about is the way it affects our teens and our children. And you know, in terms of statistics, I mean, the statistics are mind boggling. But, you know, and I won't go into them. I mean, we know that one in five people is on a mental health drug, and that's people who are clinically diagnosed. And we know that there are so many that are subclinical um, and that haven't been officially diagnosed. We know that between 2000 and 2021, the rate of suicide in the U.S. increased by 36 percent. We know that one person dies every 11 minutes from suicide. And we also know that suicide is the second leading cause of death in those aged 10 to 14 and 20 to 34 as of 2023. So, you know, those are just the suicide statistics. So what I'd love to ask you about is, you know, what do you think this is due to? So, you know, first of all, 
we could talk about, you know, what is mental health? What's your understanding of mental health versus mental illness? And second of all, is there an epidemic? You know, a lot of people are talking about an epidemic in mental health issues. And if so, what is causing it? And then what can we do about it? Kiki, it's really, really good to see you and to be here with you. And uh, I think your focus on the future of mental health and well-being, uh, being integrative, not just of all the domains of the physiology that are involved, but all the domains of uh, psychology and the world at large that end up affecting our psychology is like, such crucial work. You're over complimentary to me that... Uh, kindness is one of the things I like about you and uh, yeah so is there a health epidemic and a mental health epidemic and what is mental health and um, the first thought that came to me as you're asking those questions was uh, I'm sure most of the people here are familiar with the quote from Krishnamurti uh, that it is not a good measure of mental health to be well adjusted to a profoundly insane society and as we're addressing what mental health is, to start with what it's not. Um, of course, there was a time when the most serious definition of mental unhealth was being a witch, mm -hmm. meaning you, know, you were actually possessed by the devil and doing the work of the devil and you needed to be burned at the stake. And uh, I have a friend, Samuel Borea, who um, after the wall, came down, was able to get a bunch of what had been previously Soviet classified documents regarding their mental health classification system uh, in Yugoslavia, I believe. And it showed that the, uh, I'll only paraphrase this, that the uh, definition of their equivalent of schizophrenia, uh, it basically showed the classification of how the uh, military intelligence influenced the development of the psychiatric system and the psychiatric diagnosis, looking at things around paranoia and that the definition of uh, schizophrenia or the equivalent included paranoia about misuse of power by the state and that that was enough to diagnose it and incarcerate someone. Um, and so to some degree, <laughs> When you look at the history of um, definitions of mental health, they have been feeling good about the dominant society in which you live because uh, the whatever the um, power structure of that society is would not want everyone to feel otherwise. You can um, think about particularly patriotic times in countries where um, a big part of being mentally healthy was uh, the patriotic impulse. Um, now, we don't have fealty to religion or state in quite the same way we used to in much of the developed world currently. Um, it's almost more to like the market and things like that. So, uh, so interestingly, like if you are a good consumer and you are inspired to um, continue to grow on the corporate ladder and make more money and buy more things and excited about the uh, results of your own productivity in those measures, you're pretty mentally healthy. Um, and I would, of course, not consider this a good definition of mental health, and I don't think it actually tracks to any of the underlying subjective experiences or you know, to consider a person mentally healthy, I think, not just how they navigate their own experience of the world, but how they affect other people's experience of the world and other life forms experience of the world, because we can't see mental health in isolation. So if you, you know, you mentioned that uh, my primary work is on global catastrophic risk. And specifically, we're not just talking about like asteroids or solar flares, we're talking about global catastrophic risk from things that can uh, go wrong with advanced technologies like artificial intelligence and synthetic biology uh, about all of the ecosystem issues where obviously whether we're talking about climate change or species extinction or biodiversity loss or dead zones and oceans or desertification or all the issues that come from 
unrenewably using resources radically faster than Earth can generate them and turning them into waste and pollution radically faster than the Earth can deal with them. Human society as structured is actually debasing the biosphere upon which it lives and polluting the environments in which everyone lives on the way towards its own self-termination. And it's very hard to say that's a sane society. It is actually a suicidal society where it is pursuing exponential progress on the way towards a cliff. And so, um, and if you look at how many species go extinct per day as a result of human activity, if you look at how many animals are in the most extreme gruesome suffering possible in factory farms, if you look at how many people's lives are in unnecessarily terrible conditions as a result of uh, social systems, it's, it's hard. And you also look at the fact that uh, from a deep analysis, if we, if we were to solve climate change from particularly CO2 issues, it buys almost no time because the dead zones in the ocean are mostly not from CO2. They're from nitrogen runoff, and phosphorus and industrial fluent. And the overfishing is not from CO2 and the um, deforestation is not in the, there are actually so many different things that are on path to self-induced termination that it's actually like an underlying feature of civilization. So I think it's fair to say that the civilization is insane. Like something that is in the process of, and it's very interesting, right? Like you think about a cancer cell as opposed to a normal healthy cell in the body. Normal healthy cell cells that shares the same genome as all the other cells, so they epigenetically differentiate. And it is limited. It does not consume all of the resource it can and reproduce as fast as possible. It consumes and reproduces in a way that allows it to have coherence with the rest of the body and system that in turn supports it. If a mutation occurs, right, some oxidation happens, creates genetic damage, you get a cancer cell. The cancer cell actually consumes resources, particularly sugar, faster and reproduces faster, no longer in check with the rest of the system. And if it succeeds at doing that and getting other cells to do that, metastasizing, there are the most cancer cells right before the person dies. And then there's no cancer cells. And so the cancer actually suicides itself, right? It's pursuing increasing growth, like look, how many more are on doing the thing that we're doing? Um, but it is debasing the host upon which it lives and civilization is doing a similar thing. So the being well adjusted to a society that is behaving like that, I would say it's not a good measure of mental health. And of course, then this brings up what uh, now being completely dysfunctional in the world system as it is would also not be a good measure of mental health. So how does one navigate this world with some capacity to make sense of it, some capacity to cope with it, some capacity to develop the kind of emotional resilience to take in all that's happening, feel it, not, not be numb, but also not just be crushed out of having any agency and be able to find some agency to navigate it, but where the goal is not to succeed at the current society's definitions of success, but to work at uh, creation of a world system that is actually sane. I would say like a good definition of mental health would require that. Um, and then, of course, if we say that our world system is not healthy, not sane in some very deep and profound ways, then, of course, we can look at are there one of the ways we could say it is is not conditioning the healthiest people in some important metrics, maybe is in some ways and not in other ways, which I think is really interesting for us to get into. So then you can get into uh, various definitions of mental health crises that are not the result of an individual being messed up for something wrong with them or even just family of origin, but really due to much more systemic causes. I would say if you look at... Um, sociological analysis of psychology or anthropological analysis, society-wide kind of analysis, critical theories perspective on it, then mental health stops being primarily something wrong with the individual. Hmm. Right? The, if you think back to the evolutionary environment of humans, uh, 
humans as a social primate, an individual human by themselves in the wild didn't survive, wasn't selected for. We only groups of humans in social relationships with each other. So the unit of selection was not an individual. The unit of selection was tribe. It was a social group of people. And, um, and so being effective autonomously is actually not aligned with the type of social animal we are or our evolutionary history. And obviously, if we were banished by the tribe, we would die. So being in right psychological relationship, I have a friend's professor at MIT who one of his critiques of Maslow's hierarchy was like, it is a post-industrial model where we have replaced our need for each other that was evolutionarily the case with the market, where I can provide some good to some business that provides it to the market that gives me money that allows me um, access to all the kind of resources and the police will tend to my security and the fire department and the military and the, all these kinds of things. And I can buy the food and I don't have to know a farmer or a cobbler. I don't have to have anyone like me. I can be an asshole with no healthy relationships. And um, that in that context, which is a very new evolutionarily, very new and weird context, then we think about the individual in a weird way. And we can then say, well, the bottom of the hierarchy is security before belonging. But for all of human history, there was no security without belonging. Belonging was actually deeper in the stack, um, which very much maps to things that Gabor Mate and people in attachment theory and like that might speak about. Um, in which case, the unit of psychological analysis is not just what is wrong with this human physiologically or psychologically or their family of origin, but what environment were they born into where their psychology is being imprinted and adapting to that environment? And a lot of their anxiety and neuroses are actually what was trained in them. And or a lot of their sociopathy is what is actually adapted in that environment. So that's such an interesting perspective because you're so right. I mean, we always do think of mental health as sort of individual mental health. You know, this person is suffering from depression or anxiety or ADHD, but you're putting it in a much wider context. And you're saying that actually our current epidemic and our current crisis in mental health is the result of a dysfunctional society, which is, you know, which has got a lot of things wrong and which is creating an environment psychologically, emotionally, mentally, and physiologically, which is unhealthy for humans in some sense. So we are creating a society that is unhealthy and, and therefore unsustainable. Now, what interests me in what you're saying is, you know, there, there are a lot of aspects to unpack. So, you know, you can look at the physiological aspects, which are, you know, that we're creating a climate crisis, there's soil erosion, there's demineralization of soil, which means that we get fewer nutrients. We have processed foods, which means that we get fewer nutrients, which are key, you know, cofactors for our mental health, for neurotransmitters, etc. You can look at the fact that we're taking all these antibiotics, that they're pesticides, that they're unprecedented levels of toxic chemicals in our environment. And these are all messing up the gut microbiome and therefore having a huge impact on our mental health. So those are sort of the physiological aspects. So high levels of toxicity, you know, poor nutrition, which are all impacting the individual's mental health. But then from a sociological and sort of psychological perspective, there is also a sort of dissolution of our communities. There is a, you know, sort of competitiveness and a sense of disintegration in some sense that is affecting you know, all, all humans essentially, but in a way it's like the boiling frog, right? We're not really aware of it because we're in it all the time, day in, day out. And so we're being bombarded, not just by physiological toxins and, and sort of dysfunctional physiological mechanisms, but also sociological and psychological ones. And would you say then that the crisis in mental health is sort of a combination of these different factors and that the rates of, you know, and we haven't even mentioned social media and technology and the sort of 24 seven connectivity. So you have the paradox between this 24 seven connectivity where we're always overstimulated and on all the time 
versus the disconnection, you know, in terms of real social engagement, which is fundamental to the nervous system. And so would you say that this current crisis that we're responding as humans to this sort of dysfunction on all these different levels in our society? A lot of threads in there I'd like to get into. I think one I'll start with is uh, you see this beautiful view behind me, of these mountains and these trees and the Blue Ridge Mountains and um there's a phenomenon I love to watch, which is when someone comes to visit from New York City or the Bay Area or whatever, and we stand on the porch and there is a, you can see so far because, and so there's the ability for depth perception to calibrate so much farther. And there are so many different species here. There's not, um, you know, a bunch of tree of one species after clear cutting and replanting. And um, there's so many birds and the sounds that uh, people go stand outside and look for a long time and don't pick up their phone at all. Mm -hmm. And that in, in the evolutionary environment for humans, this was normal. And what's so interesting is that we mostly destroy these environments. There's very few of them left and then move to cities that optimize for productivity and certain metrics of comfort and things like that. Um, but even just the sensorial richness of the beauty in the, in the visual field and the auditory field and all the senses, not being around that creates a hypo normal, hypo insufficient stimuli of our actual evolutionary stimuli that creates a certain emptiness that is then looking for something that the market then offers through a bunch of addictive hits. And so when you look at a society that is characterized by more and more hypernormal stimuli across every metric, and when you look at that, you know, well, food scarcity has been an issue for every, you know, species and humans throughout evolutionary history in the developed world, diseases of overconsumption of nutrients, of overweight and obesity are the leading cause of physical health uh, issues. Um, and you were talking about less nutrients, and I want to clarify for a minute, radically more macronutrients, i.e. total calories with less micronutrients, minerals, vitamins, enzymes, phytochemicals. Um, so we claim, look at the higher level of nutrition given to everyone um, because of counting a very tiny subset of what is considered a nutrient. Um, but, you know, when you look at what fast food is and when you look at what, you know, so, so much of like developed processed food that creates addiction is very high macronutrients with very low micronutrient ratios. All the macronutrients are from kind of, if they had any derivative in a plant product, it was a highly hybridized one that was part of that, let alone the change to the soil conditions and whatever. And you extract from the plant or the animal just the parts that evolutionarily were very scarce. There was not that much fat. There was not that much salt. There was not that much sugar in an evolutionary environment. So the few times that someone had access to it, there was a strong pleasure dopamine opioid response to get more of that. In this environment, there's excessive amounts, but we still have the same genetics and dopamine opioid kind of response. And all the various forms of fast food are combinations of salt, fat, sugar with different kinds of added taste profiles and palatability, the crunchy version, the drinkable version. The... And so it's this hyper normal stimuli that will make normal stimuli right after a Twinkie raspberries don't taste super sweet whereas compared to a normal environment they're they're like oh, so overwhelming you can go into rapture from them and so the hypernormal stimuli desensitizes to normal stimuli but one of the things about it is it also creates this hedonic treadmill where you keep needing more of the stimuli and you're getting desensitized to all other forms of stimuli that are not as hyper hypernormal when people look at this view and they hear the sound year after year, it doesn't actually get less. 
Mm. It doesn't you know, keep needing more of a hit because it's actually not a hyper normal stimuli. It's the evolutionary stimuli we co-evolved with that we, we co-regulated with our nervous system actually evolved our physiology and our psychology to regulate with. And in the presence of the fullness of, and so nature is one thing, right? Also in a kind of tribal environment, the relationship, the deep, intimate, trusting relationship with a bunch of other humans, not one human that you marry and maybe still don't trust all that much. Um, but maybe, you know, up to the done runner, we're like 150 people who know everything about you intimately because there, there's no walls, right. And that, you know, and all of whom lives are invested that from an attachment theory perspective, it's attachment in that deeper way and regular campfires and music and dancing and whatever, and togetherness, that's the evolutionary type of stimuli for human psychological health when that's missing and we're in a hypo normal environment where we're in a sterile home that no matter how pretty we make it is actually just not similarly um enriching fulfilling to the whole century experience is not complex in the same way we don't have and and we we want to get rid of other humans because humans are a pain in the ass but then we go on tv to watch other humans and scroll facebook to look at other humans but the version of them that isn't a pain in the ass it will give us the most quick dopaminergic stimuli with no actual com obligation to show up to another human or be vulnerable or any of the things we don't want to do and yet of course that's a hypernormal stimuli that leaves emptiness and then seeking another hypernormal stimuli so you'll move from the fridge to the facebook to the you know whatever um so, so much of the susceptibility to hypernormal stimuli, whether it's the dating app or porn or food or productivity, productivity is to meaning what porn is to real intimate relationships or what fast food is to food, right? It is the, ex like the check the box is not a meaningful life. You can check all the boxes and still get to your deathbed and realize that your life was fucking meaningless and you were very productive and you're very productive at adding to a system that was killing the world. And so you extract a particular dopaminergic ingredient, remove all the actual nutrients and kind of double down on that hypernormal stimuli. The market's oriented to do that because from a supply side, if I run a company, I'm fiduciarily responsible to maximize return to shareholders. And I do that best by increasing the lifetime value of a customer. And I increase the lifetime value of a customer by hooking them as early as possible. And addiction maximizes the lifetime value of a customer. They keep coming back. And then, of course, I have the plausible deniability of saying, well, supply and demand. They want it. I'm just supplying it. Yeah, it's manufactured demand. So, of course, after you put the uh, vending machine in the school and get kids addicted to something that even adults can't deal with well, then, of course, it's natural demand. Same with the drug dealer or anything else. And so market forces can appeal to the lower angels of our nature and one marshmallow circuits better than the higher angels of our nature and two marshmallow circuits because there's just not as much to sell about things that have me looking to my own self and looking to the natural environment. There's more to sell of something that someone can, you know, commoditize control. So, um, so I think if you want to talk about mental health issues that are ubiquitous, susceptibility to increased addictiveness and compulsiveness writ large, which means decreased intentionality, decreased base fulfillment, fulfillment being associated with very narrow sets of stimuli. That would be one of the phenomena that we would look at. And we would look at social media and food and et cetera as applications of that. And then we would see the ubiquitous body dysmorphia that most teens have now that no one ever had historically in the same way as a result of the hypernormalization of visual image of people through photoshopping and then AIing what they look like online that means that then they will always be a substandard version of that in any embodied sense and etc um and that so much of the hypernormal stimuli susceptibility is both a result of an unhealthy economic and regulatory system, but also our susceptibility from the hypo normal environment in which the things that constitute a meaningful human life are mostly devoid, which would be deep, rich family relationships, deep, rich, extended family community relationships, the deep cultivation of our creativity, our sense of purpose and meaning, our sense of what any of this is about in our relationship to the whole web of life and what death and suffering are about and how to navigate it, our relationship to nature and to our bodies and to physicality, 
all of which has to be the foundation of what our civilization is helping us tend to, since it is the foundation of life, if it is to be. I mean, all this, when I listen to you, it makes total sense. And I think of it in terms of my own children who are, you know, 17 and 14 and who basically will not read a book. They haven't read a book in years. And yet they used to be voracious readers, you know, when they were 10, 11, 12. And now they're, they don't touch a book. All they do is scroll TikTok, you know, and they're addicted to their phones. And so, you know, on the one hand, I listen to you and I think, okay, come on, this is too pessimistic. Like surely, you know, you're painting a picture which is too pessimistic of our current society. And surely there are, you know, there is community. I mean, there are people who group around activities and who, who you know, love each other and show up for each other. And, and you know, we're trying to control our tech use, et cetera, on the one hand. And so I think one has to be careful about being too pessimistic. But then on the other hand, I look at my children and the way they're growing up compared to the way I grew up and how their you know their their phone is an extension of themselves and so not only are they getting bombarded constantly by EMFs and i have no idea of the long term impact that's going to have but also it's rewiring their brain i mean they've both been diagnosed with ADHD and so you know and i'm sure that this constant scrolling and this instant gratification has rewired their developing brains to have attention deficit issues i mean how could it not so there's these two points. I mean, on the one hand, are you being too pessimistic? And I mean, are you know, surely as a species, we're adaptable to our environment, you know? And so, and, and we don't know, this is a gigantic experiment. We don't know how we're going to adapt long-term. I don't know how my kids are going to turn out in the, in the future, you know, and they're the first generation or maybe the, yeah, the first generation to have grown up with this technology. So... You know, do you think you're being too pessimistic or do you, do you not see some hope for the fact that we'll adapt to this this environment and we'll, you know, we'll 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 compensate for it in some ways? Let's we, let's go even further. Right. You're saying maybe there are things that seem kind of bad right now, but maybe we'll adapt. Mm -hmm. And obviously we can see historically some species went extinct, but other species adapted and net net evolution seems to move forward. Isn't evolution moving forward? Will we adapt? We could go further and say, no, it's actually better than it ever was. And we're cherry picking negative things to pay attention to and over focusing on the negative valence. But didn't we read uh, Pinker and Diamandis and Hobbes and whatever, aren't we over romanticizing the, way that it was in the evolutionary environment because wasn't it really brutish short nasty and mean and people only lived to be 30 years old and there was infanticide and misogyny and blah 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 and don't we have better human rights now and look at all of the freedoms and look at all of the amazing technological advances we're talking across continents mediated by satellites and um <clears throat> and isn't it kind of awesome that we have all of this medicine including psychiatric medicine and um would i want to go back to a time before Novocaine or cell phones. Um, let's go ahead and take that whole package on and uh, briefly. I believe that the most dangerous religion in the world today, the most dangerous orienting worldview that has fundamental explanations for almost everything and ways of addressing what is pathos, what is logos, what is the way humans should move forward that has articles of faith. So I'll call it a religion in those types of sense, but I'll call it a worldview formally. The most dangerous worldview by far, way more than the evangelical Christianity that would blow up abortion clinics and way more than the caliphate Islam that would behead people who disagree is the naive progress narrative. Mm that expresses as techno-optimism and capitalist optimism and modernity optimism and things like that. It is by far a more dangerous worldview. Okay. It sounds like I'm an idiot or a radical now. No, never. <laughs> and so I want to um, make the case a little bit. Do I th like that Novocaine exists? And do I think that when one had to deal with dental type issues before Novocaine, that sounds kind of nasty, of course. Are there lots of aspects of scientific and cultural 
and technological development that I think are fair to call progress in a wide sense, definitely. I, but now, and you know, so have, have I read the progress narrative books? Yes, of course. Um, now, <clears throat> Consilience Project, we wrote an article, my, people might enjoy called uh, How to Mislead with Facts. And it basically says, I can take facts that are uh, true by the deepest definition of any fact checker, but I cherry pick the facts. So I can have a Gaussian distribution of things and cherry pick all the ones on this side, not this side. They're true facts, but they're not representative of all the things, right? And even which Gaussian distribution am I looking at? So I can cherry pick the facts. I can decontextualize them. I can take them out of a context, apply them in another context in which the context change actually changes the meaning of it. And I can Lakoff frame them, right? I can put a framing on them. So do I call them terrorists or freedom fighters? Depends upon which side I'm on. The uh, American revolutionaries were terrorists, the British, right? They were freedom fighters. And now for America, they were the founding fathers. And so, and yet anyone else who's trying to become free and secede and whatever is a terrorist. So um, do I call them illegal aliens or do I call them undocumented migrants seeking asylum? Do And so of course, I'm talking about the exact same fucking thing, but I put a moral or emotional valence on it. And we actually can't not do this. That's happening all the time. So between cherry picking, decontextualizing, recontextualizing, putting moral valence on, I can take a hundred percent true stats and draw a conclusion that is a hundred percent specious. And that it's not, that's a thing that is done sometimes it's that in journalism, that's almost never not the thing being done. Yeah. Uh, because the earnest desire to know what is true is to, who wants to pay for that mm. uh, the desire to say the thing that is aligned with our political party or that appeals to our um, readership that already has a set of a bunch of biases that wants certainty, even if artificial and wants to know who the bad guy is that c they can blame for the problems and orient to the in group. And the, there's just so many vested interests that have one do that thing. So, um, if I look at the progress narrative and I talk about all the things that democracy and capitalism and technology and modernity and whatever have done, and I say, well, let's, let's ask all the native people how well modernity went for them, how well the progress narrative went for them. Oh, I can't. We extincted most of them through genocide. Like almost all the native Americans were genocide. How many? Like a hundred million right? Like four times more people than were killed in all of World War II. And the progress narrative has to fucking deal with that. And not only did we take this just undeveloped land because it was open, it wasn't. It was many, many advanced ancient civilizations, some of which had amazing wisdom and beauty. They were savages. And we had to civilize them. And uh, you know, and we had to build our infrastructure with slavery and then we extincted the bisons and extincted so many things. And, you know, so how well, how ask how the progress narratives to all the animals in factory farms, whose life is just permanent torture to all the extinct species, to the extinct people, to the few peoples that are left in shit conditions. So, so often <clears throat> what we're doing is saying the, the progress narrative is saying for this in-group, things got better. This in-group is some people, not all people within a group. Even within the group, it's some classes, not all classes in the same way. And it's some metrics, quality of life in these metrics. So you'll hear dumb shit like, well, the average human used to live on $1.50 a day in 1850 in the United States, and now they live on $50 a day. And even adjusting for purchasing power parity or inflation, look at what that is, or you know, hundred dollars, whatever it is. Yeah. But they grew most of their fucking food. Mm. They hunted, they, they cut down the trees themselves for their home. Their house was not mediated by dollars. Like a, their, a little bit of their life was mediated by dollar, but a huge amount of their life was mediated by a direct relationship with other people in the ecosystem and barter and self-sustainability. So the decontextualization of dollar did not mediate quality of life. That is ridiculous. Right. So you have to come back to that. Then of course, quantified things that get measured and specifically the subset of those that we really pay attention to, like 
GDP go up is good. Well, GDP goes up in war. GDP goes up with addiction. More addiction, more money to spend, right? GDP goes up with the body dysmorphia that drives the addictions to address the thing. GDP, good measure of total health. GDP goes up with environmental destruction, right? Increase the rate of mining and pollution. GDP goes up. So, so then you add another metric. The qualified things, when everybody is on their deathbed reflecting on what was meaningful, it's not quantified shit. Mm. It was not how much they added to GDP. It was it, it it was not it was not their productivity list. It was like the most meaningful things are also the most intangible. They were feelings of love between them and people. They were feelings of the numinous that they had. They were places where they were transcended their own little selfishness and really showed up for other people in meaningful ways that don't get measured and optimized in that narrative. In fact, they're the things that most get fucked in the pursuit of the quantified things, right? And even the quantified things, we are not measuring how well the Native American societies are doing in that, like even where we could measure stuff. So we're we're picking very partial measures. So do I like Novocaine? Of course. Yeah. And let's just, let's even just look at this one. And now I'm gonna make an example that sounds kind of extreme, but it's so important to like kind of get the frame. You look at Weston Price's work that ended up being significant in forming what became the American Dental Association. And in the 30s, he was looking at some of the native tribes around the world that had not yet had conventional agriculture, uh, what we call conventional, that it was obviously not at all the historical, you know, hunter-gatherer life. Specifically, didn't have primary amount of their diet come from grains and refined sugars and things like that, and found that they didn't have dental issues. They didn't have cavities and they didn't have the overcrowding where they needed orthodonture or their wisdom teeth removed. And the hypothesis was there were the mineralization of their diet and the nature of the fatty acids in their diet and whatever led to a bone density where their mandible and maxilla didn't grow super crooked teeth and had room for the uh, wisdom teeth. And now, of course, people have this, this research is not perfect, um, but there is much true to it. Now, the Hobbesian narrative, brutish, short, nasty, and mean, of course, their longevity is shorter if you factor infant mortality. But that doesn't mean people only have to be 30 years old. This is just a gibberish interpretation. Old people were old people for all of human history. Um, and infant mortality, we have grown our population from 500 billion people just a couple hundred years ago, right? The whole of 200,000 years of sapien history, 2 million years of hominids never got above a half a billion people. We went from a half a billion people at the beginning of the industrial revolution to 8 billion, which means 16 times the extraction of earth's resources, but we didn't, and 16 times the pollution, but we also increased the per capita resource use by over a hundred X in the developed world. Obviously people who are um, in the upper economic bracket, it can be thousands of X. And so you're talking about, you know, something like 1600 X overnight increase. And, in, and which is why now the, the geological age of the Anthropocene, the surface of the entire planet is mostly defined by human activity. Mm. Now coming back to the, will we adapt? There was an article published a few months ago by the American uh, chemical society journal of uh, American chemical society on forever chemicals in the environment and rainwater, the fluorinated surfactants, PFAS, PFAS, those ones. They're called forever chemicals because there are no biological processes that break them down, kind of like styrofoam, but these ones are like little bitty invisible styrofoams. They're the, the rain X and all the, all the things that um, are used in packaging and to make water retardants and, um, you know, certain industrial surfactants and stuff. Because they're designed to be water repellent, they float to the surface of water. They're so small, they actually evaporate, which means they get into the rainwater, rain everywhere. This study showed that rainwater samples all around the world in very, very remote places had higher than EPA levels of these chemicals, including in snowfall in the middle of, of Antarctica. This means that they're here, right? And no matter where, they're are chemicals that are carcinogens and neurotoxins and endocrine disruptors, that there are no biological processes that, because we, they, they were not part of the billions of years of biosphere evolution. They were things that we figured out how to make in super advanced chemistry labs. 
that biology cannot process. Will we adapt in time to deal with that? Totally not. Mm. Totally not. And so in the same way, if we make something, right, the biosphere, if you really want to understand, like the biosphere is a few atoms, like mostly six atoms and some trace minerals in certain types of molecular arrangements. And that is a very old thing, right? That's like a multi-billions of year old thing where every animal, fungus, plant, everything can break down and get turned into everything else through the same processes. And we start mining the shit that the first billion years of geology and hydrology took the mercury and the cadmium and the arsenic and the stuff that would be super toxic to biology, locked it in rocks and put it way deep under the biosphere. We mine it up, separate it out, stick the fucking lead in the gasoline and internal combustion for silly reasons and blow it into the atmosphere or the PFOS or the whatever, and are actually changing the chemical constituents of the biosphere in the most fundamental way that biology cannot process. It can't even deal with those atoms, let alone those advanced molecular forms it can make. Would it adapt eventually? Like maybe, maybe in some Chernobyl type style after killing almost everything, some new mutant type of stuff comes about. Can we adapt to organophosphates and phthalates? And whatever? No, psychologically, same. Mm. We are creating things that are foreign enough that they are outside of the functional adaptivity range. That's an important thing to get that all animals are shaped by their environment. We're the only animal that changes our environment so radically because of our extension through the types of technology that we can make environments that we are not actually well fit to, but we will make the fitness selection will be a narrow one. Does this society win in war? It makes it through the other ones are killed. Might the native Americans have caused no fucking environmental issues and still been fine and been fine with a steady state population for a long time. Sure. But were they going to be able to compete with guns? No. And so the thing that makes it through is not necessarily more sustainable or more true, good and beautiful. It's more effectively dominant at extraction and war was the Maoist China invasion of Tibet. Did China win because it was good, more good than Tibet or because it was better at dominance, even if that same dominance pattern is on the path to self-termination. Mm. Now, history gets written by the winners, which means I can't say, you know what? The civilizations we destroyed were lovely people. They were more wise, kind, enlightened, and better relationship with the environment. And we're just super effective, violent fucks. We can't say that. So we have to say we would civilize the savages. We, we brought Christendom to them. We brought... Western civilization, we brought whatever the fuck the thing is that we're saying we brought, we brought science and technology. We brought capitalism or we brought Christendom are the same thing, right? Which is, and so history written by the winners turns into a naive progress narrative where the things that won get measured and all the things that got destroyed don't. Now, if you want to have a progress narrative that isn't naive, you have to say, this measure that was advanced, what was the cost? Where was the cost externalized? Not the internal cost that we paid for, but all the costs we didn't pay for in terms of the effects on the environment, whatever. And in the same ways we can see that our industrial supply chains don't pay for the cost of what it would cost nature to remake that thing or to deal with all the waste. It's just the cost of us extracting it. How much does it cost us to extract it? And then a tiny margin and that's it, right? And so... We actually don't pay for 99.9 something percent of the real costs of a thing. We just fucking steal it from nature. So then nature's getting depleted on one side and polluted on the other. We also do that from the human psychosocial substrate. And so there's a huge amount of pollution going into the human psychosocial substrate, like shitty thoughtware. And, you know, as you're mentioning, the erosion of attention span. If I, if for me to get a dopaminergic hit, which had an evolutionary purpose, which was following something that required hard work, right? That had some, like I had to hunt that game or I had to achieve some. So the upregulation of strength and capacity of the system over some duration with attention, usually with some coordination with other people would result in that thing. So that thing was, that hit was associated with something authentically long-term adaptive then I can extract that thing from the adaptive thing and just double down on that thing, just like the monkey that can just push the button and to the brain wiring. Um, okay, so now we erode, won't do hard things, because why would I do a hard thing? 
and won't work at the edge of my own capacity, won't bother dealing with the difficulty of figuring out coordination and harmony with other people because I can just get the reward anyways at the end. And attention span will go down because I get the reward so quickly. Why would I not have the reward for a long period of time? There is, if you study some theory of mind, you won't find a definition of consciousness that does not require the definition of attention as fundamental. Mm, that's very interesting. You're is right. Is there anything that it means to be conscious that does not have attention and that does not have some regulation of attention? You also, if, if you think about consciousness very quickly, the topic of agency, free will, whatever comes up. So the topic of intention. So insofar as you're, the stuff you're spending your time scrolling was not stuff where you said, today, I would like to spend this much time doing this and I'm going to go looking for it. It put shit in front of you that it knew would hypernormal stimuli jack your attention and thus your intention, right? You're becoming less intentional and more reactive to an environment that is gathering personalized info about you to maximize hypernormal stimuli that you're susceptible to. So your intentionality is going down and your attention is going down. The most basic concepts at the foundation of what is consciousness. So is it, if a technology is eroding the most foundational things that it means to be human, can it be good? No. Now, could we build technologies to gather data about people and do advanced curation algorithms, whatever, that had totally different business models that were not optimizing for the maximum addictiveness and engagement to drive ad models or whatever. Could we build ones that were actually good in a wider definition? Sure, I could use the personalized info about you to make personalized education systems and personalized psycho-spiritual development that found the most useful things for you, but that's not the business model, right? And so I'm not saying there are no positive applications, but net, the business model the financial model is extractive of human attention and behavior in the same way it's extractive from the environment. And so when you look at in the same way that there are natural resource, which is a violent, terrible concept, a whale is not a natural resource. It is a sovereign, sentient being with a brain that is bigger than any humans that probably has types of sentience and phenomenology we can't even imagine but it's a natural resource or a tree that might have been alive since before the time of Jesus. It's a natural resource. What the fuck? Like what a sociopathic concept that all sentient things are natural resources. Slaves were natural resources, right? Okay. So now we have human resources. What the fuck? Like, how is it that every thing of meaning is a resource for some commoditization process? Okay. So the goal is not the well-being of the whale or the tree or the human resource. It is the effective commoditization of it for, you know, the movement of that power system. As soon as you start to realize that, you're like, the system is not this, this system, the, sis, the system where the people coming into North America slaughtered the Indians that were here and enslaved all the blacks was not trying to be a optimum well-being for everybody's system. The Chinese system going into Tibet was not an optimum well-being system. The current system is not an optimum well-being system. It's not fucking designed to do that. It is not measuring authentic well-being metrics. It is not trying to do that thing. It's important to get that, right? But it is trying to sell itself, of course, because it has to. But the memetics through which it sells itself, just like, yes, if you if you get who God's name is wrong, God will burn you in hell forever, not so that you learn and do better, just as a sadistic fuck who's going to punish you forever for no for no learning reasons. Even though he was omniscient and knew everything you would ever do and was all loving, somehow God works in mysterious ways, don't have any doubt. And then there's, and it's like the dominant system just pushed that crazy shit, right? And the current dominant system pushes the same crazy shit. You're questioning capitalism. Are you a communist? Don't you understand? You know, and, uh, and it's like, no, no, not a communist. We can do better. We can invent new, better stuff. And that isn't just selected for in war and the narrowest definitions of progress that externalize cost everywhere else. What is it a healthy human psychology? Individually, collectively, what is a meaningful human life? What the fuck are we here for in a deep way that is not us as a resource for some machine? 
but factors the intrinsic meaningfulness of human life and future human life and life in general. And what would it mean to make a civilization where the, those were the central things that we were oriented towards? Now, of course, most people are not like, well, I know how to change a hundred trillion dollar a day global post-nuclear weapon Bretton Woods market system that is advancing ex at exponential speeds with artificial intelligence. I just want to know how to fucking feel better in this world. Okay, we can talk about that. But the I I don't understand what is really making me feel the way I do, and I just want to feel better. The narcissism of that I can think about me separate from everything else is actually the one of the core drivers that fucks everything up. Because there is no psychological health where I don't recognize my interconnectedness with all that my life depends upon. I and think ultimately I'm in service of that. And I think, okay, so there's so much to unpack here, Daniel. <laughs> um, that's very beautiful. So a few things I just want to um, pick up on is, you know, you talk about attention and the importance of attention and consciousness, you know, attention being a subset of consciousness and essential to consciousness. And one of the other things I wanted to point out is attention is also fundamental to love. You know, a, a, an expression of love is attention. And so I think that's a really important point. The other point that I wanted to make is, you know, you talk about all these measurable, you know, things, measuring things. And, you know, that brings me back to the, the, the whole, I mean, I'm trying to come back to the whole sort of health aspect. We see progress at the moment. One of the aspects of progress is an ability to measure things. So, you know, there's this whole movement of wearables and measuring your blood glucose and measuring your heart rate and your heart rate variability and measuring your sleep and measuring, you know, we have all these gadgets and we think that actually this is the future of medicine is being able to measure all these things. And yet what you're saying is that it's actually what can't be measured that is the most valuable. And the, again, even by trying to fix, you know, our health and fix our mental health, in some ways we're getting it wrong again by, by breaking things down to things that we can actually measure. And maybe that's a criticism in some ways of functional medicine as well, is that, you know, all these lab tests and, you know, maybe that's opening too much of another can of worms, but all these lab tests that we do to measure, you know, various different infections and toxins and et cetera, you know, you're, we're boiling things down to, to data essentially. And data is important, but what you're saying, what I think I'm hearing is that, you know, there's so much more that is intangible and immeasurable in terms of mental health. Medicine, whether for physical health or for functional psychiatry is doing that is good, is within the focus on physiology and do science, measure stuff and, and you know work with physical causation model. It's measuring more stuff. It's recognizing and not just what is the um, marker of pathophysiology in complex cases to then be able to offer a drug that was not part of how a healthy person was healthy. It was not part of how that person when they were younger was healthy. It was not part of an evolutionary environment that ever created health, but that stops a symptom or some aspect of pathogenesis, but maybe has side effects that will end up needing other drugs later saying, let's go upstream and say, is that rheumatism actually resultant or at least partially resultant from some underlying infections or deficiencies or toxins or whatever, where we can do things to treat that upstream thing. So in that way, it's a movement towards increased considerateness, right? Kind of like GDP plus Gini coefficients plus a carbon accounting, right? It's like adding additional things so that you aren't externalizing or neglecting or whatever in that area. So that's good, right? And Rather than simply say, well, we have no idea why you have rheumatism. And so we're just going to do symptomatic treatment to be able to say, well, there are these things that are going on upstream that at least sometimes statistically correlate with increased chance of rheumatism, whether it's the Lyme thing or the mercury thing or the whatever, let's go ahead and work on those, see what happens. Sometimes rheumatism goes away, but whether it's mercury or whether it's lead, you're going to use different chelating agents to be able to deal with it. And whether it's Lyme or EDV, you'll use different infectious agents to deal with it. So there's some value in that. Totally. I think this is fantastic. And we were so excited in the human genome project that we were going to crack the base code of life and 
then we would solve all these diseases. And it's been kind of amazingly disappointing how many diseases we have not solved since figuring out the human genome project. Because, oh yeah, which genes you're expressing has to do with this thing called the epigenome that wasn't even on the damn map. And then that creates a proteome and a transcriptome that recurrently change the epigenome. Oh yeah, and the microbiome and the virome and the parasitome modulate the epigenome and modulate the proteome and the and they weren't even on the fucking map really in that way. So there's so much stuff that is in the unknown unknown set that is affecting the core stuff that our overconfidence that we understand the right variables to measure and control is our way of compensating for our uncomfortability with uncertainty. Absolutely. And so do we want to keep learning more things and factor the things we've learned? Of course we do. Do we want to also hold that there's really important shit that we are not factoring in there? And that there are also some things that are never metricable. And even as far as metrics goes, there's an uncommensurability of metrics where there are decisions that are still qualified, right? Because I can't say how many of this metric is worth how many of these when I can't con convert them into each other, right? And um, so more deeper metrics has value, but also even in the limit, it never converges on reality. This is what the Tao that is nameable is not the eternal Tao means. This is what the thou shall have no false idols means, right? The actual God, the actual nature of reality is incomprehensible, inarticulatable. And the thing that we are to be in service to and the articulatable version of it, the best articulation is a false idol, is actually a sin to take that thing too seriously. So mm -hmm. don't take it as an idol, take it as a, this is a useful model that is definitely missing critical shit that we don't even know it's missing yet. As such, we hold it as useful at best, while wanting to look at where it is actually anti-useful, where we might then be so optimizing for the things we're measuring that we're harming the things that we don't even know that we're not measuring, that are interconnected and causally affected, right? This requires, of course, much, it requires more rigor to notice more metrics and their relationships, while more humility that how much we notice is tiny. Right now, we get to know relatively little and feel very certain. Yeah. Which yeah. is the front of the Dunning Kruger curve, right? As we move fo forward on it, we will work harder to know way more and have way less certainty. Mm -hmm. But in that, also, the universe still works at all, more kind of awe, which is part of mental health, right? And more kind of gratitude and more kind of curiosity and more kind of both desire to know and appreciation that universe works beyond what I know. Yeah. And I think that's, that's very, very beautiful because I mean, that sort of brings me to, to, you know, what can we do about this? So we know that there's an epidemic of mental health issues. We know that it's due to the sort of, you know, messed up way our society is going in so many ways. We know, for instance, that functional medicine to an extent is is progress in the sense that it can measure more things and that it can take systems approaches to healing, which is far more than can be said about sort of conventional psychiatry. And we can look for root causes of what's causing, you know, the depression and the anxiety, et cetera. But then, you know, what I always say with my website is I always say there are three components to mental health. There's the biochemical, which is the hormones and the nutrition and the gut and the toxins and the inflammation. Then there's a psycho-spiritual, which is the purpose and meaning, the trauma, the difficult life circumstances, you know, the sort of spiritual components and the psychological ones. And then third, there's the lifestyle behavioral. So, you know, getting out in nature, how you sleep, how you exercise, how much sunlight you get. And it's only by taking these three aspects into account and diagnosing and treating people taking these three areas into account that really you can get people sustainably better. But notice how all three of those mostly deal with the individual. Yes. Yeah. So I would consider all three of those necessary, but not close to sufficient. So what is the key missing component? Is it connection to other humans and a sort of consciousness that we're all interconnected and that what we do to one we're doing to the whole? 
there's a libertarian pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It doesn't matter what's happening in your environment. Just be responsible for your own mental well-being that has value, right? And the fact that we can see a certain kind of potential for awakening inside of Auschwitz and a Viktor Frankl, we're like, okay, it is possible under the most terrible circumstances for awakening to occur. And we would like for everyone to have more internal locus of control when their external environment is less in their control, right? But it is also true that the environments in which people grow up determining or influencing their beliefs, attitudes, aesthetics, psychology, statistically following distribution curves is crystal clear. And it's kind of like, let's say you look at the issue of um, systemic racism in the US. You can, there are plenty of successful black people in the US who actually emphasize, I don't think there's any racism. I don't think racism is a thing that black people should think about. I think if you think about it, then you can blame something else for your success or failure. Just take full responsibility for your success or failure. And that actually not thinking about it, not believing in it, you'll do better. It's a very libertarian kind of approach. And there's not no truth to it. There is some truth that to the individual, that is the case. Will that affect the reality that there is systemic racism? No. Um, it will just say, under that condition, you as an individual might do better. Can everybody do that? No. Does that actually neglect the need to work on, yeah, there's a huge amount of passed on generational wealth that was created in slavery, passed on in the white families, not passed on in the other ones. There's a huge amount of generational trauma never dealt with here. Like people don't have fair starting points in that libertarian model. Um, and they're not being born in the conditions of similar education systems or similar trauma or similar access to home loans. Or So the what do I do for me to do better in the system and how do we make a better system are both important questions, not one or the other. But it is too easy to overfocus on only the individual one and allow the systemic one to keep getting more messed up. Can I do all of the fancy tests to know what chemicals are in my body to do all the fancy IV detoxes. Yes. Is that helping fix the fact that industry is fucking the environment for everyone and everything in all life forms and that these toxins are in all the animals and the soil microbes? No. no. So in some way, I just get to separate myself from everybody else <laughs> because I'm privileged enough to have the money and access and whatever to do those things. If, if you have that privilege, fucking awesome, then use that help to work on bettering the world for everybody else in real ways, right? Um, and if we made a industrial system that did not deplete the topsoil in the nature of how it did agriculture and it didn't pump a huge amount of poisons into the atmosphere, nobody would have to do that shit. Like, do you even need a functional medicine that is testing for environmental toxins if you're not pumping them into the environment at scale? No, we just, that's one of those things where we made a thing to fix a problem that was actually a result of our civilization system itself. Right. So now we have to figure out super fancy geoengineering to figure out the fact that we fucked the environment from the stuff we figured out to not have to deal with horses as the means of transportation. And so you call it progress, but in some ways, largely, we're just solving the problems that were already the result of the earlier aspects of how we solved earlier problems and externalized other parts in the way we did that. We have, to, and this is why when we talk about holistic medicine, it's how do you, can I give you a drug for your liver? that will long-term also damage your kidneys or something else. And then the result is an iatrogenic cascade where with age, you need more meds to deal with some of the side effects of the meds and the fact that you didn't deal with the upstream stuff, which is why a healthy person in that evolutionary environment, the health was not the result of having those meds and the disease is not a med deficiency, right? And so the the allopathic parts-based approach to well-being and the kind of parts-based approach to progress and the civilizational narrative are the same thing. The need for a more holistic consideration of human health and of how we how we human in the world are the same thing. And so, you know, you and I were talking bri briefly about this, that, you, you know, Buddha's noble truths, we start with, everybody's going to die. You do all of your 
life extension and radical longevity and the aesthetic medicine and beautification and, ha- and personal growth and everything, you're still going to die and you're still going to age before you die. And the luckiest you could be, if you're the luckiest person, you will live a long time and you will develop a lot of deep, beautiful friendships, which means that you will witness a lot of people you deeply love die and grow old and suffer before they die. Then you will die. That's the luckiest you can possibly be, right? So a huge part of psychological health is, okay, so I'm, when I die, life doesn't end. My life in this form ends, but life continues. I'm here for, I get to be here, part of this whole game of life for a little while. And like, what a fucking miracle that there is experience as opposed to no experience. There could just be nothing. And as soon as I realized, like, I got to see a tree at all. I got to see a sunset. I got to see color. I got to hear sound as opposed to just nothingness. The like, what's in it for me? I need more shit as a mental illness, right? What's in it for me is a fucking mental illness. And the like, I am a, what the fuck? Existence exists and I'm a part of it for a little while is awakeness. And then I would totally choose to incarnate just to get to have experience at all, even a little bit of it, as opposed to nothing. From there, when I die and life doesn't, some of my actions will continue to affect the life of and consciousness of others. So when I put life and consciousness at the center of what I care about, not my life and my consciousness, because there is no real happiness in narcissism. There is no meaningful human life in that, right? You were asking, what is mental health? Is there any definition of mental health I care about that does not involve deep compassion and empathy? No. Mm. Is there any way to have deep compassion and empathy without suffering deeply? No. Is the version of mental health I want one where people have suffered (laughs) and they can then be in deep connection with other people suffering in a way where we don't get rid of it, but we see the potential for nobility and beauty and and grace and how we relate to it right i mean that's so beautiful and again i mean it brings up so many so many things so mm-hmm. one thing that really struck me was you know we talk about root cause medicine and functional medicine and we always think oh you know the root cause is lack of nutrients or too many toxins or you know there's some causal factor that's causing inflammation but you're taking it from a really macro level and you're saying actually the root cause is what we're doing to our planet. It's what we're doing to our society. So you're going way beyond the individual and their biochemistry, and you're looking at the whole ecosystem and how the root cause of our mental health crisis starts you know, way beyond us and how we're behaving, how we're treating the planet. Think about this just real quick. Yeah. So Rachel Carlson writes Silent Spring. We realize the pesticides. Go back and watch some of the American commercials from the 50s during the time when four out of five doctors choose camel cigarettes. And look at the ones with DDT where they're saying, we get to solve the issue of terrible mosquitoes. And they're just pumping the DDT on the food and everybody and on the kids and the kids are running in the DDT. And it's like, wow. And so then we say, no, 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 it's actually this super terrible biocide designed to kill everything and kills all kinds of stuff. So we make it illegal. And then we replace it with a new thing that is just as poisonous. We just don't have 20 years of cumulative effect to show us as poisonous because it's not just something that kills instantly. It's something that increases rates of cancer and whatever over delayed causation, right? So are the neonicotinoid pesticides that we're using right now that cause the colony collapse disorder and kill the pollinators, are they less dangerous than DDT? No. Are we... Are we using exponentially more biocides every year than the year before globally? Yes. Do they break down quickly? No. So you have not only an exponential curve per year, but a cumulative effect across all the years. Okay. And then are we also doing that with all the VOCs that are in the paint and the carpet and the blah, blah, blah? Yes. Okay. If we say that one of the root causes is toxicity, from the Anthropocene that was not there in the environment, in the uh, evolutionary environment, which is why our kidney and liver and limb system are not designed to deal with them well, which is why we have to help it along. The idea of let's keep polluting the environment exponentially more per year with cumulative effects and then try to detox people. Like that's the stupidest thing I have ever heard of. Let's 
keep a shitty system of agriculture that demineralizes the topsoil to grow hybridized plants with a genetically weird version of those plants that are like the version of a chihuahua compared to a wolf of the banana or the tomato or the whatever it is that then we have to supplement forever and do heaps of labs and per- like i love functional medicine i love i use a lot of supplements i help make a supplement company because i actually think they are valuable because of these messed up things is it the world i want no mm. i want a world with a good agricultural system where all of, where the trace minerals and the microbiota of the soil are rich and that doesn't have an industrial system that is filling the environment full of pollution and waste and et cetera, where, where people are not being made unhealthy from systemic causes continuously. Right? So if someone does not know how to fix that right now, yes, figure out how to get the nutrients your body needs, figure out how to deal with the underlying infections that we have from a globalized system and where you have MRSAs and fungicide resistant molds from having put fungicides in paints and not factored that they would mutate and like figure out how to take care of yourself, but on your own oxygen mask first, but this is not a solution for the world. Mm. So if I ask you for solutions and I say, okay, well, what's the solution to this global mental health crisis? You know, so what you're saying is, you know, fix the whole system. Yes, you can fix yourself as an individual and you can use functional medicine and you can detoxify and you can make sure you get the right nutrients and you can meditate and you can go outside and get the sunshine, et cetera. But the main thing is that all of our mental health and our physiological health is going to suffer as long as we don't fix this planet that we're on. Is that what you're saying? I mean, what are your, what are your concrete solutions uh, in order to address this mental health crisis? Fix is a weird word, right? Mm -hmm. Because I fix myself and I still die. I'm still going to die. I'm probably not, if I'm lucky, I'm going to age before I die. Mm -hmm. If I do the best job of longevity extension medicine, I'm still going to suffer from results of aging before I die. Um, So fix, I don't don't know what that means. Um, That mindset is part of what's wrong. Mm. And in the obsessive pursuit to fix myself because of the affirmation that I'm broken and that then I can somehow get fixed. And until that, I have to keep focusing on my being fixed. I'm messing up my appreciation of life with that weird concept, Mm. right? Um, I am not a robotic system that can be broken and can be fixed. I'm not a mechanical system. I'm a living system subject to all kinds of complexity. And so I would like to support greater health and resilience and homeodynamics while also holding that I'm definitely going to die. And that on people's deathbed, the things that they say, man, now, before when I reflected on last year, what do I want to do this year coming up on January 1st or whatever it is, I'm always reflecting in light of thinking I can do it over differently next year. But on the deathbed, that that doesn't happen. There's a deeper type of reflection. And I've I've been on so many deathbeds with people. My parents were awesome to take me to old folks' homes and get to have that experience a lot. And I have never met old folks who spent their time wishing they had fixed themselves more or had were their highest. What I really was important, if I could do it again, was a lot of narcissistic focus. Like this just has never happened. The what was really meaningful was always the ways they expressed love to people. And the ways they offered things that will outlast them and the ways that they appreciated life. And so there's so much of getting fixed that happens by just letting that whole fucking mindset go and being like, right now with whatever's going on, if I can deepen my appreciation of life that I see, if I were to die now, I would die more full. And I can offer more love to people right now. And I don't have to get fixed to do that. Right. And there starts to be a tremendous amount of increased well being from that orientation. And I love that. And I think it's so beautiful. But just to play slight devil's advocate, 
you know, when you're dealing with teenagers who come to you, as sometimes happens to me and say, it's, you know, I can, I can't get out of bed. I'm so unhappy. And I think about taking my life on a, on a daily basis and I can't connect with people and I don't understand what's happening to me. And can you help me? You know, what do you say to them? I mean, you know, my, my tendency is, okay, let's fix them. Let's look at their gut. Let's look at their nutrition. Let's look at their family dynamic. But, you know, it's so heartbreaking when you're on the front lines of meeting people who are really suffering because to die is one thing, to age is one thing, and to suffer has meaning if you give it meaning. But there's some people who are truly suffering with their mental health who don't have that meaning making, they don't have enough perspective to get that meaning making, or maybe they're too young or they're too, and you know, what, what do you say to them and how do you help people like that? Because that's, to me, it, it it's, those are the people that, that I would really like to reach and really like to help. And I think saying, well, yeah, you're going to die and all this has meaning is, I'm not sure how helpful that would be to them. Maybe it would be, but, you know, how would you address that? Someone told me that I knew that they were having a hard time getting out of bed and that they thought about taking their life. I would just sit with them and try to make it safe for them to share what was going on deeply enough that I could feel feel where they were with them mm -hmm. and I would let go of all desire to try to fix them because then I'll be looking for what I can do to make it better so I'm just looking for a oh that's a gut issue mm -hmm. or oh that's a, and I try to reduce the depth of their experience to some little thing that I can fix and it to them and their suffering. It doesn't feel like a gut issue. Mm. And, you know, I had a teacher of uh, therapy who was really masterful, brilliant man named Barry. And he used to say, if when you're working with someone, you're trying to think which modality do you apply? You are at best a um, technician. Mm. who is looking at which technique you will apply, but you're not doing healing. Because mm. um, you're actually more focused on the technique and how to apply it than connecting to this being. And the technique is actually getting in the way of your ability to connect to the being. And the healing is always an increased connection. And so he's like, just watch the movie of them. Just take it in until you get the gestalt and you can feel what they're feeling and you can get why they're saying what they're saying, like you've really inhabited it. And then you might find that none of the techniques you have are actually worth much of anything for them. But you, at minimum, they're at least not alone in the experience now. You can, they can, they feel gotten, they feel felt, and there's healing instantly and in not being alone in it. Yeah. And then you might be like, I actually don't know what you need, but I'll work on finding out with you. Like we'll explore this together. And um, I think so much of what makes suffering, like deep psychological suffering, it's not the only thing, but so much of it involves um, isolation and aloneness. Mm. And a lack of feeling deep intimacy. Mm. I have found that people who had deep existential angst and thought there was no free will and there was no meaning in universe and whatever. If something happens and they fall in love, the existential angst is gone. And that, you know, what, what people like Gabor Mate will say in terms of that the most likely indicator for addiction is uh, loneliness. It's that whole thing of the hypernormal stimuli filling the hyponormal environment, the, the, the core of the human environment is yes, a connection to nature. Yes. A connection to our body. It can, and a connection to other humans, right? And the Ubuntu concept I am because we are, and the because being I is not the fundamental concept. We is more fundamental than I, because 
They were here before, they will be here after. Without them, I wouldn't exist. Without me, they would still exist, right? The, the all is deeper than the part. Right. And so I play a role in it, but I am actually a less deep concept than we. And without the we, I wouldn't exist at all. So when I think I, I'm actually scientifically, ontologically thinking poorly. Mm. Because I, I'm Daniel, I'm here, I'm, I'm thinking in words I did not invent. I am taking for granted a whole way of living that depends upon heaps of other people. I am breathing air that I require that is made by those trees and by algae and by, and if those things were gone, I wouldn't exist. I would stop existing or who I think I am would be totally different. And yet I can take for granted that which I depend on, not included in my definition of I, and then I can actually harm that which I depend upon in service of I. That mm -hmm. is the psychopathology driving the world. Right. So when I get, I am an emergent property of a complex reality. I'm an emergent property of a biosphere. I'm an emergent property of a social sphere. I'm an emergent property of a family. Without all these things, I don't exist and or I wouldn't be who I think I am. I'd be some totally other thing. I'd be nothing or I'd be some totally other thing. Then I cannot benefit me if, if the way I'm thinking about improving me doesn't even have a causally clear concept of what the fuck I am, the fuck I'm a part of or depend upon, then which there's no chance it could succeed. Right now, here's something very interesting. I have met certain people that would be considered uh, sociopaths or psychopaths who really did not suffer very much in their own experience because don't really feel guilt, don't really feel shame, don't really feel uh, obligation, don't really feel sadness, don't really feel anybody else's sadness, don't really feel, but can totally feel pleasure and wins. I'm not stoked on that, right? And so, um, and that person, so is happiness a good measure of mental health? Not in a superficial assessment of what it means, right? Because you can, you can be a schmuck causing massive harm to the world. I, I can be a sadist where my happiness comes at causing suffering, right? So only the kinds of happiness that correlate with the happiness and the well-being across lots of types of others, right? Or let's say I am bypassing all my own pain because I can't deal with it. And so I have a kind of put on fake superficial happiness where then anytime someone tells me that their family member died or is suffering, I'm like, oh, well, there's probably a silver lining in it. It's like, shut the fuck up. Like that, that way of tending happiness that is not real actually causes suffering in other places. So part of what I would call consider mental health is understanding my relationship to reality better. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of that, being able to navigate life in a way where there is well-being for me, but the way that I impact the rest of the world also creates well-being for everything I touch. It has to be both. And the what makes someone have a what makes someone capable of moving through suffering when they're in it, and what makes someone look back at their life on their deathbed well is almost always how they were in service to something greater. And their life is the their life depends upon. Them. So the so the person you asked who's and this is one of the fucked things, is like, I know lots of people who are in a bad enough place that they cannot get themselves better. The addiction spiral is such that they they don't have the knowledge, money, resources, agency to get themselves better. The, the To simply make it through not dying, to make it through not being overwhelmed and having to kill themselves, the only way they can do that is through something that takes pain away for a moment that makes something worse or whatever, or they just can't get out of bed. Or they, And this is where it's like a we actually need each other. You know, um, and I think there's a lot of diseases that psychological diseases are considered incurable 
in a totally libertarian model, but in certain kinds of tribal judicial systems and tribal psychological environments, they either never occurred or were curable. Mm. And um, so your question, if I'm with somebody who's really suffering, the first thing I would do is just really be with them in it. Be willing to feel what they're feeling, not try to diagnose them, Mm. not try to give them a libertarian reason of why they could or should be doing something better. Uh, I may have to, in the process, face maybe they're feeling some meaninglessness or existential terror that I'm avoiding in myself by excessive productivity or whatever. So I don't want to do that. I'd rather just fix them and not have to face the fact that I have the same fucking issues and I'm just less honest about it or I have better coping strategies. Um, And so then I would look at that and be like, wow, I am incapable of loving them and really being with them because I'm too fucking afraid of the realities that they're saying that I'm avoiding in myself. Mm. Otherwise, can I actually be with them and say, not only will we all die and go, through suffering, but we will also all go through some type of real tragedy. And if I haven't moved through that, if I haven't faced it and moved through it, I can't help you. Mm. Yeah. So only the person that has really looked at and moved through heartbreak, tragedy, meaninglessness can be with someone else in that and not need to just try to frantically fix it as a coping for their own inability to be with it and have any sense of trust or any wisdom about it. I mean, that's so beautiful. And, you know, when when you were describing also that sort of happiness, um, you know, it makes me think of the different types of happiness. Of course, there's hedonism and there's eudaimonia. And I think you're referring to eudaimonia, which is the sort of a more purposeful, meaningful happiness, which, uh, you know, involves helping others and, and having purpose and meaning to life. I love what you're saying about, you know, just sitting with someone without having to distract and whether you're sitting with them, you know, in whatever suffering they're, they're in, whether it's mental suffering or physical suffering and just being able to be present and to be conscious and to be aware and to give them attention and therefore to give them love. I think that, you know, those are really important concepts and 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 an important approach that we do tend to forget you know as people who are trying to heal you know heal others we have this sort of intentionality of like you know we we need to fix people and so thank you for putting that perspective out there the other thing is that you talk a lot about death more so than i've heard you talk about in your other podcasts and i understand that your father passed away a couple of weeks ago And I'm really sorry about that. And I just wonder, obviously, it's very much in your consciousness and in your mind. And I just wonder what sort of thoughts and lessons and insights you might be able to share with us, because I know as a very deep thinker, you've, you know, there are things that will have shifted in you because of that experience. And I'd love if you feel comfortable, of course, if you would be willing to share some of those with us something that's been on my mind that I've been reflecting on and learning quite a bit from just in the last little while since my dad has passed that I will share first because it's just on my mind Um, and we'll share something about some of my reflections on the precursor, some of my reflections on death. Um, And I was saying, just sit with somebody and try to at least have the in whatever suffering they have, they don't also have the suffering of being alone and misunderstood and be with them. Sometimes some, some people are just for all kinds of reasons, better at that than other people. Um, and even the people who are best at it, it can be easier to do that with people that you are less close with than your family sometimes because we have our triggers wound up, you know, with theirs and easier to just have full presence. Um, One of the things that I've been reflecting on finding so interesting uh, over the last couple of years, but over the last couple of weeks in particular is there's obviously a lot about the human experience that is universal. Everyone 
has desires for intimacy. Everyone knows what loneliness is. Everyone has desires for meaning and significance and agency and learning and creativity. Um, but within that, which is universal, people's experiences are profoundly fucking different, more different than I have given enough credit to historically. I think I focused on some of the universal commonalities more. And I think there were also places where I had um, an unusual enough life that some things that were normal for me were so statistically not normal. And I underfactored how much that meant my experience of life was a relevant frame for empathy for other people's. Because when we say, well, if I was in their position, what would I feel? A mistake I have made a lot is not recognizing that that is actually the wrong question. If I, with the life history and experience and whatever that I am was in their position, how I would feel is super irrelevant. How do they feel being them, having had their history, whatever, in their position? I will often come to recognize the only answer I have is I have no fucking idea. Like, I'll try, but I actually, like, I don't know. And there's something <clears throat> that with more humility in that, one can then try harder because they recognize that the glib thing is actually not right. One of the things that I have been really kind of marveling at lately is that if someone was raised where, for whatever reason, there were certain kinds of virtues that were very real for them in their childhood that they, that are still very real for them. And there's someone else that either had no relationship to those things or only the relationship of those things being virtue signals and trauma around it or whatever. So they have a, a deeply different internal relationship. Those people cannot understand each other. Like their default assumptions will be wrong about each other all the time. They have to do a lot of work to recognize because the one person who will assume that the person who is expressing some virtue that feels real to them, that that, that person's lying their virtue signaling that it couldn't possibly be true because in their own experience, it isn't true because they don't have that experience. They don't, you know, some people just don't have really profound compassion where they wake up just being like, how the fuck do I help the animals? And for other people, they can't ever stop thinking about it. They're crushed by that. And so for the person who doesn't have that experience, they can't even imagine that that's true for the other person has to think the other person is lying in virtue signaling. And um, similarly, the one person might not be able to understand why the other person is doing things that seem asshole or selfish and just can't make any sense of it. And it's like, well, they just must be hurting really, really bad. Maybe not. Like maybe they are, <laughs> but maybe they actually grew up in an environment where they actually have a value system around uh, Darwinian dominance and things like that and not compassion. And um, so similarly, people who have had a lot of existential angst and depression and suffering have a very hard time feeling understood by people who just have not had those experiences, you know, mm -hmm. and vice versa. And so it's interesting to recognize how much our own experience may not be all that indicative of certain other people's experience or whole class of people's experience and to say, as hard as it is for me to imagine what it is like to be a whale, it might be kind of like that to imagine what it's like to be another person and to try to get it properly and to not make sure I'm fit to, to try to make sure I'm not filtering it through the lenses of what seems familiar to me. One of the things about that is how radically different people's motivational landscapes are, what is motivating for them and not. I just had two friends that were in a conversation where one of them whenever someone starts to improve with something, wants to give a lot of positive acknowledgement. It's like, oh my God, you're doing so good. I'm so proud of you. And the other person was like, you could do no more unmotivating thing for me in the universe. Because if I'm doing good at something that I am pretty, that I feel like I have done pathologically badly at historically, and I'm mostly just um, horrendously embarrassed by, I just don't want attention brought to it. It feels patronizing. And like, it was so interesting because what like what one person would do to show love was actually counter supportive 
because they didn't get the other person's experience enough because they that would have worked for them. And so again, the person says that they're depressed, they want to take their life. I wanted to take my life. Maybe they're similar, maybe they're not similar at all, right? Maybe it is that there's a part of them that needs to die. And, but maybe that's not it. Maybe it's just that there's no part of them that feels really deeply connected to life. I just, I want to let go that I have any fucking idea to begin with and really keep trying to get it until I have the sense that I get it and I can express it where then they have the sense that I get it. Right. So um, that's very interesting to me, not just the, how do we have empathy, but how do we make sure that it's coming from a deep enough place, factoring the differences or interiority. So thinking about my dad, my, uh, you know, if any, if anyone is interested in this, find me on Facebook and you'll see who my dad is and you go to his Facebook page because mine has more activity in the conversations that I posted on there about this will get buried in the news feed, but it'll stay near the top of his since it's just kind of a memorial page now. And, um, and I'm finding old writings of his and posting them show like what a, thoughtful, deep, brilliant being that he, that he was. Um, but I post on there some letters of correspondence between he and I before his passing and various things. And um, my dad had uh, a, a really unusual amount of suffering from all, all of the kinds of violence uh, in his childhood. And so he did an amazing job of finding meaningfulness and purpose and self-transcendence and virtue and um, nobility in the presence of that, but kind of in the borderline personality disorder way where the part that is in trauma is so much trauma that another part of the self kind of fragments off, right? Can see the trauma from up above, floating above, isn't in the trauma anymore. The part that is seeing the beating or the rape or the whatever it is from up here doesn't mean the part down here isn't still feeling it, right? And so then you have a pain body that is the survival mechanism was to just get out of it, right? It was too much. There was no agency. But then the part that got out of it is actually pretty free, pretty higher perspective can sometimes become intellectually or intuitively or artistically super gifted mm. and but you might have a dr jekyll mr hyde or some kind of weird thing because it's not multiple personality because there's not a distinct break in personality there's a continuity of personality but there is the one that is all of the brilliance pretty freed from pain and then all of the pain that can access almost no agency mm. and um the fact that my dad was able to go as far as he did in all the ways that he did, given what he came from is so remarkable, you know, uh, so remarkable. And he was dying for a long time from self-induced causes. You could call it self-induced. He didn't cause the traumas when he was little. So what does it mean self-induced? the addictions that made him die 20 years younger than he would have otherwise that made all the body system failure. You can call self-induced, but you can also call induced by trauma that were put into his self that were not his self, but that he didn't know how to overcome them. And uh, because of that, he and I had the um, end of life conversations many, 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 many times. Um, and so that was uniquely fortunate. We got to, I, I wrote an article of uh, things I, I specifically, this was years ago, I framed things I learned about being a man from my dad because um, it looked like he might die then. And I figured why wait to do the eulogy when the person can't read it, why not say the things where they can. But then I kind of double purposed it with, of his teachings in parenting, how many of them were particularly useful for a son and how much I looked around and saw how many people either had, didn't have fathers or had inadequate fathers and mm -hmm. how many of the men in particular who had an inadequate fathers, um, how many of the problems in the world were caused by that. Mm. 
And so I figured if some tiny vicarious amount of the goods of fathering, I could get across by that. So I, I kind of double purpose the eulogy for him. And the, so um, lessons I learned about being a man from my dad. Um, so yeah, I wrote that to him years ago and published it and um, we had all the conversations. And so all that is really positive. And yet, and, and I had gone through a lot of people close to me dying because I've been fortunate to have people that I really love and that are close and that have mentored me. So they're older. Um, my dad was a, I think death of a parent is a big deal for everybody, but my dad was particularly uh, significant in my life. So it was a particularly deep process. And as I, um, there, there was, there were so many, one thing that I learned was in wanting there to be the healing of family dynamics that occurs better when someone is still alive than when they're dead. Where of course, if somebody dies, you can still come to make peace and come to forgiveness and whatever, but it's not quite the same. And so I was supporting family members knowing that it, death was imminent to come to complete things. And in doing so, I found that I understood where they were at less than I thought. Um, I got to find how actually far from the piece that I was hoping they would come to, they were, how many more steps were needed and that I hadn't asked enough questions to know because with a new person, I would ask all these questions, but I think with a family member, we assume like, oh, I know what you went through. We were there together. Nope, nope. We were in totally different experiences. So that was really interesting. Definitely got to like have a lot of really beautiful family healing things happen. Some of them just completing moments before the end of life. And like, yeah, I'd written an article also years ago from the experiences I'd had with other people and a lot of friends called uh, conversations have with your parents before they die. And um, you know, if, if anything, I would just add a few more things to it now. But, um, and there's definitely been really interesting experiences in both the loss in the human domain and the even deeper connection in what one might call a spiritual domain since his body's passed. But if, I, if I'm thinking about like on the, what do I wish I had known earlier that I would do a little differently? Um, the conversations in recent years we've had that I'm happiest about were the ones where he shared things that he wanted to share. I made the time to take them and I appreciated him. And, you know, that's, it's not a, trivial thing because like a lot of people who have families or careers or passion projects, you know, I'm time is limited. And many of the things that he wants me, he wanted to share with me were things that he had already shared with me many times. <laughs> um, and that I had, and some of them were mixed with some of the, uh, you know, wounded parts or whatever that made it a little harder to just be um, stoked on. And yet, so it's so interesting because like the times where he was happiest were not where anybody was offering him help or support and not even compassion for any of what he was going through, but where he got to offer something that other people needed because without which there was no meaning. And the only reason for him to continue was to have some sense of meaning. And so the times that I, the conversations we had that I feel the least good about were the ones where I was trying to help him improve himself and heal himself that didn't end up working and that were ultimately just not, even though they were intended out of wanting him to suffer less and be happier, that were some lack of calibration on my part of what where he was really at, what was really possible, and that in the time where I was trying to help motivate, which is why I was thinking about motivational psychology, right? Help motivate some behavior that would cause some less suffering on his part, which is easy to want to do when the person is really, really abjectly suffering for something that could behaviorally change 
supposedly, but also kind of can't in any way, right? And I think when someone has a very broken sense of agency in a domain and someone else doesn't have a broken sense of agency in that domain, it's hard to empathize properly, which was happened for me. Um, that that same time spent him getting to share things with me that were important for him to share would have been a better use of time. And uh, so that's that's one reflection. Well, that's really beautiful. I mean, I'm sure you have a lot more, but that's very beautiful. And I mean, what if I if I wanted to synthesize our conversation and bring it back to mental health, I um, you know, one of the things that really strikes me is that the whole thread of what you're saying seems to me to be about, you know, a deep listening and a deep connection and a deep attention to yes. to people and to the planet and to the needs of others as opposed yes. to in some sense our own needs i mean we're in this sort of hyper individualistic society where it's all about self care and looking after ourselves and what are our needs and when are our needs going to be met and there's this whole movement but what i'm hearing from you is something slightly different which is you know, really connect to the needs of others and to the needs of the planet and don't try and superimpose your own ideas about how to fix them or what they need, but truly a sort of quality of listening, which, you know, can only be equated to, you know, really listening with love. Yeah. And, you know, and in that is healing. And so, you know... Yeah. You just said something really important, which is in the deep listening, there is healing even before the person listening gets the data to know what healing therapy to do. Yes. Right. Just in the connectivity, there is healing. Exactly. Uh, we can think of increased connectivity as being key to what healing means. And, and yet also in a, in a utility sense, that deep listening will give us a better insight what other things would be helpful. Both are true. It is healing itself and it empowers healing that is more attuned and calibrated. Um, but I would say it's not others more than self. Self is a part of the whole, right? Uh, mm. I would say most people don't have a deep enough listening like this with their own self because they go too quickly into what is the fix it thing. Um, or they go too quickly into also what is the coping strategy and the um, or moralizing themselves to do the right behavior the way their parents did, which is their internal parent voice, not their kind of higher self voice or whatever. And to sit deeper with like, where does this feeling come from? Can I, what's under that feeling? What's under that one? What, when did I first feel this? That process of self attention and listening and love with self, I think is a huge part of how the authentic healing happens also. And that is so true. And then one of the things that occurs to me when you're talking about this is one of the real problems with social media and with technology is that the listening is really one way. And, you know, we're, the technology and the social media is not listening to us, we're listening to it. And, you know, so there's, there's this sort of real disconnection and this real breakdown of bilateral communication, which, you know, in some ways I come out more pessimistic about it than I went in after talking to you. Well, there was a study done by Harvard psychology department that I remember reading many years ago. I don't remember all the details, but the gist I found this so fascinating was they had people go on dates with two different kinds of people, but the people it was blinded where the people who were going on the date did not double blinded. The people who were going on the date didn't know what the two different types of people were that were being tested. And the other people that were the types of people being dated didn't know what thing they were a subclass of or that they were an instance in the class of. But the key was they had um, the test audience date someone who was very interesting and kind of like would generally be considered very interesting. They had spoke seven languages, had a bunch of degrees, had great stories, had been all around the world, whatever, things like that. And 
they had them go on a date with someone who was very interested, someone who was fascinated and asked questions and was like, oh my God, you did that and tell me more. And without telling the people that that was the defining characteristic, then they asked them afterwards about their experience in dates. And you can already guess by the smile. They were like, well, what was your experience with this person? The interesting person. They're like, man, that person was interesting. They were fascinating. They did all these things. It was amazing. It was kind of an honor to even get to hear the stories. Do you want to go on another date with them? You know what? As amazing as they were, I didn't feel like there was really a spark between us. There was kind of no, yeah. And so they, it was no. And then with the other person, do you want to go on a date with them again? They're like, yeah, totally. There was just this je ne sais quoi. I can't even say why. I can't even say what it was about them. Um, and so in real interaction, someone can respond to the quality of your listening, right? Mm. And now in social media, I get likes for what I said. I get reshares on what I said. I don't get anything for how well I listened, right? It's not that the social media platform doesn't listen. It actually listens like a motherfucker, which is how it can harvest all the information about my click patterns and like patterns and friend patterns to put the most addictive shit in my newsfeed. But it's listening to commoditize me, right? To make me something that will buy more shit from the advertisers who are its customers. So it's listening, it's spying, it's using privileged information and AI to listen for pathological purposes to direct massive AIs at manipulating the fuck out of me without me realizing right? Okay. So it's actually listening in a very pathological form in the way that a manipulative sociopath listens. And, but the incentives on the platform, and if you just think about this for a minute, if you read Marshall McLuhan, the media is the message that when we change the media of communication, the entire sensory experience, the encoding of our nervous system is changing from the interaction with that different form which is why there are indigenous people who say the downfall of civilization was the written word, right? You're talking about can't read anymore. They're like, no, fuck reading. Because in their story, I remember the first time a, a Native American elder who I was fortunate enough to get to go sweat lodge with was telling me this. And then I've had many people tell me, it's like, yeah, it used to be that if someone had gained any knowledge or wisdom in their old age, they spent time with young people. And the way they, they didn't write a book by themselves they spent time with young people making sure the young people really understood it and internalized it and et cetera. And if a young person wanted to learn something, they had to spend time with older people, not also in isolation in a book. And there was a, there was a connection between them. So no one was alone. No one was isolated. There was a calibration of the learning and the internalization of it and the, um, and the contextualization of it. And with the written word came the separation of some, finite set of ideas that had to have a beginning, middle, and end where the teacher couldn't see the learning process to see if it was being interpreted properly. And then there starts being an orientation to write the thing that would be most popular. And so they actually saw the written word as kind of the downfall of intergenerational knowledge transfer. And so of course we have a world where we ship the young people who aren't ready to make money off to have one money-making age person be with 30 of them. And so that we don't have to waste many money making aged people on the non money making people while they're being trained to be money making people. And then as soon as they're past the money making age, we ship them off somewhere else where there's only one money making age person with lots of old people. And the old people are dying of Alzheimer's that is as much a disease of meaninglessness and loneliness as it is of beta amyloid plaques or anything else. Um, and which is why so many of the older people who are in isolation, when they just start having the grandkids come around more, they start doing cognitively better and emotionally better because fucking duh, right? And as soon as the kids have people who aren't paid to spend time with them who are waiting to leave, but people who actually love them and would die for them be around them, it's totally different. Um, but that's like the media is the message, right? The knowledge was embodied and it's not embodied. It was contextualized and it was decontextualized. So you move on, then you get to radio and you start hearing disembodied voices. For the first time in history, it was only like schizophrenics or prophets before that heard disembodied voices from a burning bush. Where now everybody's hearing these disembodied voices, and it leads to a different kind of mind that can make sense of that world. And you get TV, and now I get voice and image, but on a 2D screen. So now I start orienting to a huge amount of my time being a two dimensional world and also not interactive, right? And then you get internet, and then specifically, touch screens and then put the thing in your pocket. And each of those become such differently calibrated worlds in this one, right? 
And let's think about this thing in the pocket. If I'm getting my addictive high from skydiving, from an extreme sport, I don't get to do that a hundred times a day, right? If, if, if I'm getting it from drinking, I still usually have to wait till the evening time, right? Even if it's food and I go to the fridge a bunch of times a day, there's still a limited number of times I'm going to do that. The amount of time someone will reach for the supercomputer in their pocket that has cultivated the most addictive shit uniquely customized for them and continues to do so because it listens sociopathically so well. And it gets to be hundreds of times. It gets to be no 15 minute interval that doesn't do it. Unheard of amount of drip of addiction where this gets to give me the social media version the news version, the porn version, the productivity version, the messaging apps and notifications version, all these different things like, whoa, um, would there ever have been that personalized to you, that continuous, that ubiquitous source of addictive drip across all those verticals? That's novel, right? That's a novel thing. And adults can't deal with it well. Like sometimes the ones who never got into it, boomer generation or older, maybe they can, but the ones who started to engage with it, they can't deal with it well. And the fucking people who are growing up with it as kids, right? Where now I want to come back to the 2D screen for a minute because I could come to any of these. There's another study that I saw that I found fascinating many years ago that was looking at languages that had very different phoneme patterns where if people learned the language after a certain age, they almost never got a perfect accent. Mm. Um and English and Japanese was one of the examples given in the LR correspondence and how hard that is. And the thing that it was a neuroscience article, what it was arguing is that we have an umwelt, right? We don't hear everything. We don't see everything for relevance. We have to filter some stuff out the, the sounds we're hearing in our early childhood, the brain is actually developing to be better at hearing those sounds because those are the ones that are being selected as relevant. That if there's a particular kind of phoneme that you didn't hear in your early development, you might never be able to hear it because the brain actually develops, the auditory cortex develops to hear the sounds that it was in its developmental environment exposed to. Okay, so now in a evolutionary developmental environment for humans, we're in an environment where we're climbing mountains or climbing trees or climbing rocks and having a lot of three-dimensional experience where in order to get a dopamine hit, our body has to move. There has to be hormesis in, as well as the other thing where there's a huge amount of physicality and social interaction and coordination activity. And, um, and everything has depth perception and dimensionality and and all the senses, right? The kid puts the thing in their mouth and they smell it and they touch it and they feel it and they throw it, get a sense of the reception of it plus they look at it and listen to it and so the the reality is grounding in their experience across a very rich tapestry of sensorial experiences and embodied kind of agency and the demacio embodied cognition sense kids starts to spend a very high percentage of its time in a 2d world that only does visual and auditory it doesn't do scent doesn't do taste doesn't do kinesthetics but also doesn't do proprioception and all the sub aspects of kinesthetics of temperature and texture and et cetera, et cetera. Not just it's maximizing for hypernormal stimuli and short attention span. It's also only optimizing for two senses in a tiny perceptual range, in a very tiny depth perceptual range. And, a, and now how much, if that's happening early in development, is the brain not even developing to be able to experience more of the world that was never part of its developmental environment. Now, when I move from the 2D screen of the TV where my agency happens by selecting which channel, as there are more channels, so you get the surfing of the channel being the early version of the scroll, the infinite, the infinite scrolls personally customized to me, the other one isn't, and I get to interact with it more. Now here on my phone, not only do I have a, fully 2D world, right? Like I, I have a physically 2D flat world, but also just auditory and visual. So 2D in both of those senses. But it's, I get to just push buttons and everything changes. The entire world changes by me just pushing a button and the entire world is customized to me. Mm. If I wanted to make flatland narcissists, that's how I would do it. 
if I wanted to make an entire population as a psyop, and I'm not saying anyone did this, I don't think they did, but if I wanted to, I would say, well, let's have kids do almost nothing to create huge changes in dopamine hence. Let's have the world fully customized to them where they de the default expectation is everything should revolve around them and customized to them. Let's have it give them a bunch of reward over the things that they put out, but not the way that they, um, you know, li listen in any meaningful kind of way. Like if I wanted to produce fucked up cluster B people at scale, that's how I would do it technologically. Wait, this is so depressing, but, but yes, I mean, Daniel, I, um, you know, we've been talking almost, well, two hours now, so we, um, we should probably wrap up and you've been incredibly generous with your time, but I have to say everything you say is so true and so wise and so thought provoking. And I really hope that this is provoked a huge amount of thought. Um, and one of the things, you know, obviously there's a consciousness raising and awareness that happens, but I guess as a final sort of to tie everything together and not to be left too depressed, what is your word on, you know, like if there's one takeaway that we can tell people, you know, what can we do about this? What can we do about improving people's mental health? Is there one maybe two things that we can do that's a little more hopeful or optimistic and that's within our reach that we can leave people with? I understand the purpose of the question, but it's also a goofy question because if we're talking about the human microbiome has been messed up, which affects up, which messes up, the way the monoamine neurotransmitters in the gut affect brain chemistry through the gut brain axis and microbiome is messed up both by the food substrate that is given plus ubiquitous antibiotics and chlorine in water and um, pesticides in the environment and things like that plus the soils demineralized plus environmental toxins that come from every single industry in the world plus the screens plus the what's one or two things we can do to fix the side effects of the entire fucking world system are we talking about pesticides or herbicides or the PFOS or the antibiotics or the chlorinated water or the, um, you know, so I could say that humanity takes on the project of redesigning civilization yeah. from scratch. The one thing, redesigning civilization from scratch, what we call civilization in a way that is actually not just health and sanity producing for the humans and the biosphere, but that would mean that is sane itself, right? That is healthy and sane, which means that rather than separate reality into narrow metrics where I can benefit one metric, make a company or a political party or whatever that does that, but harm other metrics in the process or harm other realities in the process, that we take a holistic consideration of all that we're interconnected with, work to understand the interconnectivity at depth and say, how do we understand all the causes of this thing, whatever this thing is that we're wanting to solve, where our solution addresses all the upstream causes, not just a kind of symptomatic shift or whatever. And where we're, where we do a more thoughtful process of what unintended effects, what externalities will that cause and incorporate those into the design upfront and iteratively. So a holistic awareness and civilization redesign, like there is no answer less than that to address these things. Okay. Now that's a good answer. I mean, that's to me, it's, it's about awareness. I mean, you know, we, we become aware and we learn. And then with that awareness and that learning, we try to redesign civilization in our own small way. Now let's come back to, I, I'm, I'm going to try to give you a more practical answer. Cause I'm also going to bring up the fact that most people will never let themselves have awarenesses that are too consequential or painful. And if they do, they can't hold them. Mm. So somebody watches a documentary that shows that the coral are all being bleached or the oceans are being overfished or the climate change and things are being Venusified or all the kids that are being um, in child slave labor in a mine in DNC or they, and in Either they don't watch that, right? Or if they do, they go numb and try not to take it in. Or if they really take it in and they're devastated, then what? 
because their job does not care about that, right? Their job requires them to focus on uh, growing the department or winning the upcoming election or whatever the fuck the thing is that they do. And there's a huge amount of demand. They need to put all their attention on it. And their family needs all these things. And there's a to-do list at home. And there's a, and so even if, or it's not, they watch the documentary. They're with a family member as they die. And they're like, my whole life is fucking meaningless. I'm doing all the things wrong. What that person said they would redo differently. I'm set up to live my life where I die with a huge amount of regret. And then they will lose that awareness in almost no time, right? Mm -hmm. Or they go to Vipassana or they do an ayahuasca retreat. And then, so as soon as they come back on this thing and scroll for 15 minutes, all that's gone, right? The, the awareness has to have an attention span to it, or it has to have an environment that keeps re-anchoring us. Because otherwise we are creatures that can modify our environment, but we are also in turn continuously modified by our environment and our psychosocial environment. So if you wanted to ask me practically, like the, the awareness of what we want to shift in our own life and how we relate with our kids and our family and what, how we want to, as a citizen of the world, try to help the world for the life in perpetuity to let yourself have the time for the awarenesses of what is actually meaningful to deepen, mm. which means the the pain and the tragedy to deepen and the beautiful, the beauty and the meaningfulness to deepen and the insanity of the nonsense to deepen, like all of those things, right? To take the time for that. And then to figure out how do I retouch in that? How do I hold it? And, you know, used to be something like go to church every Sunday. You have some way of touching in continuously with whatever your orientation into meaning is. Um, the very tangible thing is start surrounding yourself with people who already are more because mm. the environment of information you take in and the social environment you take in will affect you and the things that you do to try to affect yourself independent of that will be kind of swimming upstream so if you can pay attention to in the moments of greatest clarity what you would like to inhabit your mind more and in the moments of greatest clarity, what you would like to inhabit the time of your behaviors in your calendar more. And then say, who is already aligned with that? Or if I was spending more time with them, that would be continuously in my mind as opposed to only rarely in my mind. Mm. Uh, that's one thing that will make a tangible difference quickly. I could say lots of things, but. That's really, really beautiful. And I think that's a great place to leave it. And um, you've been so generous with your time, Daniel, and I'm so grateful. And thank you so much for coming on the Mind Health 360 show. And I wish you were president of the United States and you could change things the way you wanted to. I think, you know, we need more people like you in the world. So thank you. And um, yeah, uh, here's you know, to better mental health and better planetary health. I know we didn't touch on most of the topics of practically psychotherapeutic methods and psychospiritual insights that are applicable and functional medicine for psychiatry. And so um, if there are, I know you have so many brilliant guests that are at cutting edge of that, but if there's stuff for us to address in the future, that would be fun. I'm happy that we got to talk bigger picture today. I would love that. Let's do a part two with the more specifics of, you know, cutting edge, um, functional medicine, cutting edge therapies, because I know you're brilliant at that as well. So let's make that a part two. I would be curious actually to see what the people that are in your sphere who watch this have as questions and interests following yeah there'll be comments and uh and we can address those thank Thanks. you so much daniel i'm so grateful daniel schmachtenberger and what is your website so people can I find out a, more civilization research institute doesn't actually have a proper site up right now um consilience project does and then i have a blog civilizationemerging.com it, uh, it's old but people can check okay it out. So find Daniel at the Consilience Project um, and an old blog at civilizationemerging.com. But uh, just Google Daniel Schmachtenberger and he's got incredible podcasts with incredible people. 
and all on different topics. He's a real polymath and he can talk about pretty much everything under the sun. So I'm incredibly grateful to have had you talk about mental health and all the extensions around that. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones, or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.